Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Schneider, for that uh, generous introduction, and both of the institutions that you plugged, I'm sure, would appreciate that uh, as well. Um, ah, we got the new one on the screen. Uh, Americans bring some distinctive uh, perspectives to uh, the subject of this uh, conference, hard and soft power. And so my particular subject is how some of the relevant, peculiarly American perspectives toward that topic grow out of the history and geography and other circumstances of the United States and of the political culture uh, that grows out of those circumstances. I'm not talking about what any one administration or presidency does, although obviously we see a lot of variation uh, from one to the other. I'm talking about uh, what Americans as a whole, uh, how they tend to see things. And by perspectives toward hard and soft power, that being my topic, I mean not only preferences for using certain forms of power over other, but, but also perceptions about the consequences. Uh, and sometimes difficulties associated with such use. Let me start by throwing out two major aspects, one bad and one good, about the place of the United States in the world. The bad one is anti-Americanism, which, as I think you all know, is all too prevalent in many parts of the world, in public discourse and to varying degrees in the rhetoric and sometimes the policies of governments in those parts of the world. The other aspect, the good one, is just how attractive the United States is as a place to live. Among those who don't live here but would love to have the chance to do that if they could. These two aspects, the negative and the positive, often coexist in the very same parts of the world and sometimes coexist in the same individuals people who have lots of critical things to say about the United States, but they'd still love to hear, live here if they had the chance. The positive side of this, you know, what makes it attractive to be here in America, is certainly one of the bigger elements of soft power that the United States has. It is this country's image of, based on the reality of, this country as a land of prosperity and freedom. The negative side, the anti-Americanism, has a combination of causes, the relative importance of which tends to get debated, especially when people debate about what it is that causes other peoples to get so extreme in their anti-Americanism that they might resort to violence, especially terrorist violence. Well, some of the causes have to do with the U.S.'s status as the sole superpower. The U.S. is able, more than any other country, to do more things that more people around the globe perceive, rightly or wrongly, as threatening or destructive, because it has the power to do so. The causes also have to do with particular U.S. policies, policies that make use of that ability to do more things around the globe that can be perceived as threatening or destructive. Now, some of America's global influence that becomes a source of resentment in certain parts of the world could be labeled as soft power. And I'm referring specifically to the export of popular culture and consumerism that some people abroad, especially in the Muslim world, resent as cultural imperialism. But to a much greater degree, the causes of the resentment and sometimes even anger that underlie the anti-Americanism have to do with the exercise of hard power and particularly that quintessential form of hard, hard power, military force. So how do most Americans perceive all this? I don't mean the intellectual elite, those of you who are in a room like this. I mean Americans in general, the public in general. Well, the attractive side of the United States, um, the part that positively attracts uh, foreigners, is something that I think most Americans simply take for granted. Of course, America is a land of prosperity and freedom. Moreover, it's a land of immigrants. So it hardly comes as news that just as America has been a magnet over previous generations for many immigrants, it continues to be a magnet for many present-day would-be or wannabe immigrants. 
Now, whether or not this is regarded as a form of soft power, and I dare say once you get beyond the intellectual elite, the term soft power is not in the active vocabulary of most Americans. Um, it is not a form of power that seems to require the United States to do anything. The United States just is. To the extent that Americans talk about having to do something related to the attractiveness of this country to foreigners who would like to live here, the talk tends to be focused on controlling the movement of such people, that is to say, policing illegal immigration. Most Americans have difficulty perceiving and understanding the negative side the resentment and even anger sometimes among foreigners that stems from the United States exercising its power, especially hard power, and above all, military force. They see their own motives as pure. So they have a hard time understanding the perceptual side effects of the exercise of hard power. They focus instead in a direct, straightforward way of what we can accomplish by using an instrument like military force. Well, several attributes of the history and circumstances of the United States contribute, I think, to these particular perceptual habits and shortcomings. One is that the United States has never been threatened, really seriously threatened, by the power of someone much more powerful than itself. The protective advantage of those two moats that are known as the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean have been among the biggest shapers of American attitudes about the exercise of power and what it means. When the Republic was young and not very powerful, the country that then was most able to project power, and this goes back to something that Charlie Cupchan mentioned at near the beginning of his talk, namely Britain with its Royal Navy tended to do so in ways that contributed to, rather than threatened, the prosperity of the new North American Republic. When a more mature United States finally began flexing its own global muscle around the turn of the 20th century, it was already a match for anyone else. The most serious physical threat to the United States was the USSR during the Cold War and the nuclear age, but the Soviet Union was never more than a co-equal second superpower, and even at that, one that would prove, in fact, to be the inferior of the United States when Ronald Reagan declared in the 1980s a race for turning economic power into military power. Because of these happy circumstances, Americans tend to be insensitive to how those not similarly blessed will be attuned to the threatening side of the exercise of power by those more powerful than themselves. 